The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so today I would like to um, to cover uh, to start. Well, we'll do a lot of things today, but to, to begin with, I would like to to show two applications of Fermat's principle in the simplest possible uh, thing that we try to do in optics, and that is to focus. So the word focus will come up again and again. It basically refers to the idea. Heck on, <laughs> it refers it refers to the idea that we have um, rays. A, a, a bundle of rays that are propagating. And uh, focusing means that we try to force these rays to meet at one point. So this, of course, is very useful for imaging, but even simpler, if you want to collect all the light energy, for example, uh, for a solar concentrator or a satellite dish or something like that, then basically this is what you try to do. You try to get the rays that are coming from the source and focus them into a point. And this is valid, of course, in the entire regime of electromagnetic uh, waves, whether microwaves or uh, visible light or, or even higher, provided that the element that we use to focus the, um, to focus the rays is much bigger than the wavelength. And here I'm, I'm leaving it deliberately uh, vague, how much bigger. But um, um, Think about it that is maybe, let's say, a, th a few thousands of wavelengths or a few hundreds of wavelengths. In the microwave case, that's not exactly true. Uh, the RF wavelength may be a couple of centimeters. The typical satellite dish is about a meter. So we're talking about 50 to 100 wavelengths. But anyway, still the approximations are valid. So the, the simplest way to do this kind of operation, to, to focus the light into a point so it can be detected, is uh, with, a, a with a reflector, a mirror, whose surface is curved. And you know from experience, if you look at a spoon, that, uh, that uh, well, funny things happen if you look at a spoon. We, we will talk about that uh, perhaps uh, a little bit later. But, uh, you, you, that, uh, but uh, you know that a spoon forms images, so this is basically a, a simplification or an ideal, idealization of a spoon. So let's say that we have this um, uh, surface, and for now, even though the label says paraboloidal reflector, I will pretend that I don't know the shape of the surface. So S of X is an unknown to be determined. And uh, the goal, of course, is to uh, have rays that are coming as parallel rays uh, onto the paraboloid, uh, onto, onto this unknown shape. And our goal is to focus these rays into a point uh, on the axis of the surface. Um, what you see, you see here that, uh, that uh, they, uh, I put the symbol of infinity. I will mention that also a little bit later. If we have rays that are parallel, uh, you can think uh, according to, well, according to Euclidean geometry, uh, parallel rays never meet. Or another way to say it is that parallel rays, if they ever meet, that would be at infinity, at a very, very long distance away. So when the object of the imaging system is very far away, such as, a, as the sun or a star or a really remote source, then we can say that the rays coming from that object are parallel or they're coming from infinity. So the objective here is, again, to determine the shape of the surface S of X such that the rays all focus at a point F. So there's a number of ways of doing it. One is, for example, I can apply the law of reflection anywhere in the surface. I have the ray appearing here. I can compute the normal to the ray, I'm sorry, the normal to the surface at the point of incidence of the ray, and I can apply the law of reflection, I can solve the problem this way. But that is actually a very complicated way of solving it. It's uh, much work. So being, uh, I guess, uh, lazy, the best, way to, the best way to solve this problem is to invoke Fermat's principle. And Fermat's principle says, uh, again, to remind you, says that um, uh, rays that depart from a common point and arrive at another point, they have to follow the minimum optical path. A corollary to that is that if you have two rays that start at the same point 
and meet again at the same point, then these rays must follow the same path. Because if one of those rays follows a shorter path, it means that the other ray that followed the longer path is violating Fermat's principle. And that cannot happen. So the way we're thinking about this here is to take, for example, the central ray uh, that is going directly on axis that started at infinity will go to the reflector. It will be reflected exactly backwards and will go through the focal point F. If you take another ray that is away from the from the central axis of the of the unknown surface, then this ray also started at infinity. It gets reflected and then again meets at the point F. So therefore, the path that these two rays followed must be uh, must be the same. So how do we compute this path? Well, um, uh, uh, if you look at the central ray. Um, The central ray is coming from infinity. I will use the plane passing through the focal point as my reference. And I will calculate the path back and forth from the focal point to the reflector and back. Okay, So I basically calculate this path. This path obviously equals 2 times f. By f, I denote the focal distance of the uh, reflector, that is the distance at which the rays come to a focus. And the other path I will compute is I will ignore the path of the ray up to the, up to the reference plane, and then I will compute this path over here. So how do we compute this path? Well, the, the shape of the paraboloid is S of x. So basically, S of x is the elevation of the unknown uh, shape with respect to the other reference plane that passes through the bottom of the unknown shape. So therefore, this distance here is f minus s because uh, it equals the focal distance minus the elevation of the, of the reflector. And uh, the other, this distance over here, OK, so let me write it down. So it is uh, f minus s. This is the first um, uh, segment of the of the ray path. And the other is the hypotenuse of this orthogonal triangle, where one, uh, one uh, um, um, side of the triangle equals x, the other side of the triangle equals f plus s. And all I have to do is I have to apply Pythagoras' theorem. OK. So this is the path of the ray that, appear, that arrived uh, uh, away from the optical axis. And of course, this must equal the path of the ray that is exactly on axis that is equal equals, uh, to 2f. So now we can play with this formula a little bit. Uh, I skipped the derivation in the notes. Actually, I didn't quite skip the derivation in the notes. So, I, so instead of deriving it here, I will just um, uh, animate it. And uh, if we do the algebra here, we can basically eliminate one of the focal distances, bring the S on the other side, then do a little bit more algebraic manipulation. And after not too much work, we arrive at this expression over here for the elevation of the unknown shape. And clearly, what you see over there is a parabola. Of course, it turned out to be a parabola because I did the calculation in the cross section, in one cross section of the optical element. In reality, all of these elements are uh, rotationally symmetric uh, surfaces of revolution. So the, real, the reason I call it a paraboloid and not a parabola is because I take this shape and then I spin it around the optical axis in order to get the familiar ball shape of the paraboloid dish. But to, 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 to do a little bit uh, less uh, math here and to keep my life simple, I will only do these calculations in one plane. So, so it turns out to be a simple parabola. So then this is the, this is the we, we found an answer. This is, this is the shape of a reflector that will take a, a set of parallel rays and focus them into a focal point um, in front of the reflector. So this is very nice. And uh, we actually got our first imaging system. We managed to compute its uh, focal length as a function of the, of the shape of the element. Uh, there's a few things that I would like to remark here. One is, for example, that um, this works very nicely when the rays are indeed incident parallel 
to the normal at the center of the parabola here. If you imagine that I take this set of rays and I tilt it, then a little bit of thought will convince yourself that it doesn't work so nicely anymore. If you were to tilt the incoming parallel rays, then the, the rays will kind of focus, but they would fail to meet all at once at the focal point F. So this is a perfect focusing element for on-axis incident rays, but it, this is not so perfect anymore if the rays are, are arriving off-axis. That's, that's one observation to keep in mind. This will come up again uh, later. The other thing I would like to say is that this is a very nice element indeed, but in some cases it is not practical because, as you can see, the focus is actually in front of the element. So if you were to detect the light, you would have to put, for example, a, you know, a, a photodiode or some uh, transducer at this location, which means you're actually blocking a path of the light. Uh, professor, so I have yes. a quick question. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. <laughs> I can understand how the rays have a, a minimal optical path, but I don't understand why they have to have the same optical path. For example, you okay. uh, let it equal yeah. to 2F, which was at the center distance. So isn't it possible that the minimum optical path does not equal 2F? Or why is that the case? OK. Uh, take two rays. In our case, one ray arrives from infinity, and they both meet at F. So they, the rays can take different optical paths. One can go like this, the other can go like this, right? I'm drawing now rays in general. So imagine that this has path L1 and this has path L2. And imagine for, for the sake of argument that L1 is less than L2. Fermat principle says that if the ray is, if the ray number one goes from the first point from the origin to the destination, it follows a certain path, this path has to be minimum. But now look at ray number two. This ray also goes from the same origin to the same destination, but follows a longer optical path. Therefore, the second ray has to violate Fermat's principle. So this is what we call in mathematics abduction to, to what do you call it, to, to absurdum. That's right. Abduction to absurdum. In other words, with, by assuming that the rays have unequal optical paths, we, derive, we arrived at a conclusion that is inconsistent with Fermat's principle. So therefore, this has to be discarded. The only possibility is that L1 equals L2. So because the two rays start at the same origin and arrive at the same destination, they must have the same optical path. Does that make sense? For example, in the homework problem where you have the swimmer and the lifeguard, um, well, I guess I want to, if you have, I'll think about it a little more. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so for the cases where the paraboloid is not convenient, actually I should say for the, say, for the cases where the reflector is not uh, convenient because of the problem of blocking the ray path at the focal point, uh, it is perhaps more convenient to attempt to use a refractive optical element that is a dielectric and uh, try to focus the rays using now again a curved surface but in this case, it is a curved surface of refractive index n. And for simplicity, I will assume that the rays are again are coming from free space, from uh, vacuum or from air. So the index of refraction is actually 1 on the left-hand side over here. On the right-hand side, it is n. So in this case, uh, again, I have the same problem. I have an unknown shape, s of x, that I should follow, uh, that, that uh, I must somehow shape my refractor. And one could assume that this is anything. It could be, again, a parabola. It could be a circle, I mean, a sphere. It could be a number of different things. The question, what is it really? So, to the, so the question is actually the same as the question that I asked before. Uh, and uh, to answer it, we'll actually follow, once again, the same argument. We will use Fermat to argue that since the two rays started at the same point, infinity, and they meet at the same point f, at the same target f, they must follow the same optical path. 
So in this case, I will apply Fermat with uh, the reference plane that is tangential at the apex of the unknown refractive, uh, I'm sorry, of the unknown refractor shape. And uh, I will compute the path of the on-axis ray, which is very easy. So this path, we have to be a little bit careful now uh, when we define the optical path. If you remember the optical path, in general, optical path length equals the integral along the ray trajectory of the index of refraction times dl. So what this means now in our case is that the optical path length for this segment of the rays between the apex and the focal point equals f, the distance, times the index of refraction, right? In order to convert it to proper optical path. Okay, so that's easy. Now we have to compute the other one. So here is again, I will exaggerate it a little bit. Here is again my, my unknown shape. S of X, and uh, here is the ray that is arriving at some distance X from the apex. And this ray, according to my postulate here, will meet the axis at distance small f to reach the point uppercase f that is the focal point. So again, I have to do a little bit of geometry here. This distance is S of X, right? Because this distance, again, is the elevation of the refractor shape relative to my reference plane over here. And um, so this equals S plus this distance, which again is the hypotenuse of a triangle. But I have to be, again, a little bit careful because this segment over here now again is inside the refractor. So before I do anything else, again, I have to multiply by the index of refraction. So it has to be n, the index of refraction, times the um, uh, hypotenuse length, which equals the square root of the two sides, of the two sides squared, right? And um, what am I doing? I'm sorry x squared plus f minus s squared. That's the correct expression. OK. OK, and in fact, I could see it because my computer has a preview, so I can see the equation. But I'm trying not to see it when I'm deriving things here. OK, so that is the equation then. So again, according to the argument, actually, let me repeat it once again, because this is a, this is a very basic point. We have two rays here. One is going on axis. There is no refraction here because it is incident exactly normally on the surface. And then it propagates a distance f. So the optical path length of this ray equals n times f. Then I have another ray that propagated a little bit further in air because it arrives at the elevated portion of the refractor. And then it bends in some way that we don't know yet. But what we do know is that we want, we demand, we require, so to speak, this ray to go through the same point f. So the fact that the ray goes through the same point f, it means that it must follow the same path as the on-axis ray. If this ray, for example, had followed a shorter path, then there's no reason for this ray to go this way. It should have gone this way as well, because it would, if it hadn't, it would be violating Fermat's principle. That is the argument. So therefore, the two paths, this path and this path, they must be exactly equal. So this is what this equation says over there. OK, this equation now, does anybody know what this equation represents? If you have looked at the notes ahead of time, you know the answer. If you haven't looked at the notes, this equation doesn't mean much. However, it can be manipulated. And I did not do all the algebra in the notes. I skipped a few steps. Uh, so the first thing you do is you basically try to get rid of the square root. So you bring this S on that side. You take squares on both sides. You do a little bit of algebra. 
you bring it to this form. Then this is still doesn't look very nice. So what you do is you try to write it to complete the sum of squares here. So that's a little bit uh, messy. Uh, if you, I will let you do it by yourselves if you're interested and curious. If you get stuck and you don't know how to do it, I will post the complete derivation on the website. But anyway, after a little bit more algebra, you get a result that looks like this. It looks like a square of the surface shape S minus a displacement times another square of the coordinate x equals a constant. And this, this type of equation in, in general, an equation of the form S square over constant plus x square over constant equals another constant, which could, might as well be one, this equation represents an ellipse. Now, it is, not, it is still not quite like this. It is of the form s minus some constant square over constant plus x square over constant equals 1. That is still an ellipse, but a displaced ellipse, right? So the, the, what this really means is that the ellipse is centered at this location, OK? This comes from the displacement term in the square. And the eccentricity of the ellipse, that is the size of the minor axis relative to the major axis, is given by the inverse of this quantity over here. So it is n minus 1 over n plus 1 f. What is interesting to note is that the focal point is to the right-hand side of the center of the ellipse. And in fact, this happens to be the focal point of the ellipse. If, if, you, uh, well, if you look at the, the definition of an ellipse in, in, the, in the form of pure geometry, ellipses are characterized by two, by two focal points. And it turns out that in this case, the focus of the rays is the focal point, is one of the focal points of the ellipse. And the other, of course, is symmetrically located on the other side. OK. So this is a bit of mathematical trickery. It doesn't, uh, you know, uh, but what I want to emphasize, which is actually kind of important to know, is that the focal point is actually past the center of the ellipse. And, um, and that's, that's, uh, that's about it, really. The, the, um, the, the, the result that this is, this is sort of a, a, an ideal elliptical shape, uh, that's something worth remembering, that if you have a, a ideal set of parallel rays coming in, or as we will call it a little bit later, a plane wave, and we wish to focus it at a finite distance inside the material, inside of the electric material, the best possible shape to achieve that is an elliptical shape. Now again, this caveat, for example, if I tilt this incoming ray, then the focus will not be perfect out here. So this is the same situation as in the paraboloid. Uh, it only works so nice and so perfectly if the incidence is exactly normal. Um, out of curiosity, can anybody imagine? So if you compare this with a paraboloid, one obvious advantage is, of course, that I'm not blocking the light path anymore. What is the possible disadvantage of this kind of approach? There are several, actually. Tell me at least one, yeah. Push the button. <laughs> well, uh, the detector is inside the uh, That's right. detector. That's one obvious disadvantage. If I wanted to really use this, I would have to put the detector here. Now, of course, the ellipse doesn't have to be a full ellipse. Eh? I can always clip the ellipse over here. The rays have no way of knowing that this happened to them. So I can always stick the detector over here. So maybe I can overcome that problem. But it is, it is a problem, yeah. What is the second problem that kind of is st sticking out? Uh, um, in the case yes. of, like, if you're trying to build a telescope or something where you have to worry about the structure of your optical setup, um, you could think that maybe a solid element would be much more bulky or hard to fabricate than um, a reflecting element. Like a That's correct. Yeah. So, so, so this uh, if if you try to make a big element, a big lens, a big focusing concentrator, like a solar concentrator or a satellite dish, that is a very inconvenient shape to have. It is like heavy. Oh, oh, yeah. Absolutely, I agree. Tell me a third disadvantage.
the paraboloids can go on a very long distance, right? This one is a finite shape because it's an ellipse. You know, as it curves, at some point, it will reach a derivative equal to zero. It, it will stop there. So basically, this element captures only a finite set of rays up to the minor axis of the ellipse. It is missing the rest. Tell me a fourth and final disadvantage of this uh, setup that I, at least I could think of. I'll give you a hint. Uh, last time, Pepe did a very nice demonstration with the prism. Do you remember something that this demonstration, something about this uh, demonstration that can be relevant? Yes. Uh, there can be uh, total internal reflection, like uh, on the surface. Enter. No, but is there a possibility for TIR here? Um, the index of refraction isn't necessarily the same for all wavelengths. Okay, so first of all, let's answer the previous oh, question. No, no. Um, here, you're right to think about the possibility of TIR, but uh, if you look at it in a little bit more detail, you will see that, the, uh, that uh, TIR is not a problem in this case. At least for the rays going up to here, there's no problem of TIR because the rays come from a low index medium to a high index medium, and uh, therefore they will always refract inside the medium. What is interesting to happen to the ray that is incident exactly tangential to the ellipse over here it will still be refracted if you think about it at Snell's law, and it will give you sort of the maximum acceptance cone of the of the interface that we discussed last week. Uh, I mean, uh, on Monday in in relation to Snell's law. So so then, out of the two demos that Pepe did last week, the TIR is not the problem. It is the other one, as you correctly pointed out. So you want to repeat? Uh, who who spoke before? I'm sorry, someone mentioned the index of refraction. Yeah, yes. the index of refraction isn't the same for all wavelengths. So, um, so That's right. Yeah. That's right. So since the index of, refract, index of refraction is not the same for all wavelengths, what this means is that the focal distance now becomes a function of the index of refraction, and I may tune it. You know, basically what I do is I manufacture this shape, right? So I can manufacture it for a certain index for a certain wavelength, if the index changes, this relation will not be satisfied anymore, and therefore uh, the uh, refractive element will become imperfect. How do we call this phenomenon of uh, dependence of index of refraction on wavelength? Dispersion, right? Dispersion. And in the context of, uh, of uh, that we're discussing here, okay, it is dispersion. In the context of focusing, when uh, we get imperfect focusing because of the because of dispersion, it has also another special name. It is called chromatic aberration. The term aberration we'll see again in the next hour. Uh, it generally refers to failures of optical systems to focus light as they're supposed to. So this is the first such failure that we encounter. Uh, the term chromatic, I have an advantage over you. I'm Greek. And this turns out to be a Greek word. Uh, chroma, in Greek, means color. And this is the Greek spelling. If you want to, re to spell it out in Latin so you can pronounce it, it is chroma. And uh, that's where the word chromatic is derived from. It literally means aberration due to color. OK? Any questions uh, on, on, any, on, on any of this so far? OK, we'll uh, keep discussing similar. I'm sorry, there's a question. Uh, yes, if someone thought of a lens-like uh, element, so which has, uh, uh, in which the, the focusing takes place on the other side of the element, uh, Will it have a fourth power surface? That's the topic of the, the that's coming up actually oh. in a few slides. Okay. So yeah, I mean the answer to your question is generally 
uh, if you want uh, to focus a, pay a point from the left to a point on the right at the opposite side of the element, you need two hyperbo hyperboloidal surfaces. I I'll cover that in a second. Uh, of, of course, hyperbolas are difficult to manufacture. People typically make spherical surfaces. You can also have a sphere nowadays by injection molding. I, I, I will go into that um, also later. But uh, even that is only perfect for on-axis points. If you move points off axis, then it fails again, right? So it becomes the whole problem of optical design. Okay, so I will switch now to, to today's actually set of lectures. And uh, as you realize that we were kind of behind by almost one lecture, I think we're beginning to catch up now. But um, what I would like to do today for the rest of the two hours that we have is to go relatively slowly over a number of, of uh, different topics uh, which are also related to focusing, but as we go along, we will generalize focusing to more and more complicated situations, right? So we already saw two cases of, actually one case of focusing using two different types of elements, a reflector and a refractor. Okay, in order to make this stuff a little bit more specific, let, re let me remind you of some definitions that, that we discussed a little bit at the, at the first lecture, but I would like to remind you again with a, with a bit more detail. So one is the, the concept of a spherical wave. So a spherical wave is, uh, is what you get if you have light originating at a point source. It is also referred to as a point object. So what happens then is you get a fan of rays that is divergent, and if you plot the normals to these rays, these normals, they look like spheres, okay? So of course the wave fronts expand as the spherical wave propagates, and, um, and because these wave fronts are spherical surfaces, that's why we call it a spherical wave. Okay, again, very important to remember by definition, the wave front is normal to the rays. So what I have done here in principle is I took each ray, I computed the normal to the ray, I connected all the normals, and I get this sphere over here. I don't know if I did it very well in my graphic over here, but that's what this is supposed to denote. Okay, you can flip this situation and create a convergent spherical wave where basically you have rays that are propagating towards the point. If that is the case, it is not a point source anymore, you call it a point image. And uh, most, in most optical systems, at least in optical systems that we will consider here, this is really the goal of an optical system. You try to take rays of light that are given to you by some source that you do not control, such as an object or a star, you know, far out of reach, and what you try to do is you try to arrange your optics, select your lenses, space them appropriately, and so on and so forth, so that you can converge these incoming rays into point images. So if you wish, this is our given or our customer. And then this is what the customer wants. The customer wants uh, to form point images. So a good deal of work in the field of optics is, has to do with this problem, how you can image, um, uh, how you can create point images. I'll take this out because it is not related to this discussion. Okay. So again, the wave fronts are spherical here with a common center at the point image. But in this case, of course, the wave fronts are contracting as you go towards the point image because the rays are converging, right? And of course, at the wave fronts ideally collapse into a point. This doesn't sound very physical. And uh, a little bit later, when we, uh, the, when we do uh, the theory of diffraction, we'll, we will see in a little bit more detail what happens at that point. It is not really that the wave front ideally collapses. Something else happens that we will see. Within the geometrical optics approximation, let's accept it for now that this is the case that indeed the rays can converge to a single point and then the wave front over there collapses. Okay, this is true for pretty much every case of imaging. 
However, in a number of situations, it is very convenient to take one extreme case where the point source or the point object is very far away. I mentioned that already about half an hour ago, uh, and I called it the point source at infinity or a point object at infinity. A very good approximation for that is a star. Uh, if we look at stars at the night sky, they look like points, right? So there is, the, of course, the star is humongous. It is probably thousands of times bigger than the Earth. But because it is at a distance of um, uh, thousands or millions of light years away, it appears to us to be like a point, a point source. So again, that's another important point to emphasize. When we talk about a point object at infinity, we don't necessarily imply that it is mathematically a point, that it has zero dimension. What we really mean is it is so far away that the angle that I subtend towards that far away point is minimal. Okay? If that is true, if that assumption is true, then I can call it a point. I mean, I can call it a point source at infinity. And what happens if you really went near that point far at infinity, you would still see divergent rays. But because this ray is propagated at a very long distance, you only get to see the set of rays near the axis that departed from that point. And because all of these rays are really tightly collapsed near the central ray over here, they all look parallel. So a, so a set of rays that are propagated and are parallel, like shown here, we call it a plane wave. If you go back to your notes from the first lecture, we call it a plane wave, but, um, or a planar wavefront. But we can also call it a parallel fan of rays, or we can also call it a, an object at infinity. Okay, and uh, and um, and um, of course because the rays are parallel, if I draw the normals to them, they will form planes. They form ideal planar surfaces, and that's why this is called the planar wavefront or a plane wave. The two terms, uh, for our purposes, the two terms are identical. And of course, this goes the other way, too. If I have a planar wave also propagating like this, I can also claim that they create a point image at infinity. Okay, Because if I take parallel lines and I propagate them for an infinitely long distance, okay, what I'm about to say is not mathematically correct, but in optics we say it all the time, it is that these parallel rays will meet at infinity. Of course, parallel rays never meet. But, uh, but you can simply to justify it in your mind, flip this picture and take these rays, propagate them backwards. At a very, very far away distance, you cannot tell the difference whether they started as parallel rays or they started as a tightly convergent small ray bundle. OK, so this is because uh, very often it simplifies calculations and gives uh, a, a certain kinds of intuition. And um, again, we define it in the geometric optics sense. Uh, when we go, when we do diffraction about a month from now, we will define it more rigorously in a way that is probably much more convincing than I do now. The reason I'm apologizing for this definition is that there's no such thing as mathematical infinity in real life. Even a star, it is a very long distance away, but it is not an infinite distance away. So what do I mean by infinity? For example, uh, a Chiwi who is sitting here on the front row, is he at infinity with respect to me or no? Or what about you guys who are sitting in, uh, in Cambridge? Well, OK, the surface of the Earth is curved, so that creates an obvious problem. But suppose I could draw a straight line through the center of the Earth from Singapore to Boston. Would you guys be at infinity with respect to me? OK. The answer actually depends on a, on a lot of different things. It depends on the relative sizes that I have and you have. It depends on the wavelengths that the light is propagating. And actually, that's about it, according to diffraction theory. So we will see a rigorous definition of what is infinity when we do diffraction. For now, let's take it on faith that if I have a set of rays that appear, we'll call it a, a image at infinity. So, so sometimes we use this, the term collimated. Oh, that's a better marker, so I'll think of thinking. Collimated rays. So collimated is from the word collinear, right? in uh, parallel to each other. OK. So I included this slide 
both as a reminder and as a reference because for the next, I don't know, for the next uh, semester really, from now on, we'll be using these terms a lot. Spherical waves, plane waves, spherical uh, wave fronts, and so on and so forth. The concept of infinity applies to both convergent and divergent spherical waves at infinity, okay? All right. So the two examples that we saw at the beginning, these are basically examples of imaging sources at infinity, right? Because we had plane waves coming into the paraboloidal reflector and ellipsoidal refractor respectively. And then these two elements managed to convert these plane waves, these uh, uh, parallel ray bundles, into perfect converging spherical waves. Therefore, they created perfect point images at the corresponding focal points. And then for reference, I also put down the two equations, the equations of the two, of the two um, elements. Now let's uh, flip the coin a little bit and uh, ask, how can I create a point image at infinity? So now I start with a point source that is within my reach. Here's my point source. Here's my point source. And I'm trying to create an image of, uh, an image of, that, for, of that source at infinity. Or another way to say it is that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to collimate the light. OK. So in the case of the paraboloid, it's actually very simple. All I have to do is reverse the paths of the rays. And this may also sound arbitrary, but in electromagnetics, there's a very basic principle that says that you can do that. I will not go into that into detail, but I can assure you that from the rigorous electromagnetics point of view, this is permissible. You can reverse the ray paths, and you still get a valid electromagnetic field. Therefore, a paraboloidal reflector works both ways. You can use it either as a receiver, so you can focus a source at infinity and you can detect it here, or as a transmitter. You can have a point source at this finite distance, and you can broadcast, well not broadcast, but you can um, uh, beam it, that's the word, yes? you can beam it to a, to a very narrow, uh, you know, to a, to, a, to a target that is at a very long distance away. In the case of a refractor, the answer is not as simple because uh, uh, in the process of reversing, uh, reversing the situation, now the uh, source is in air, and the collimated light is in glass, is in the dielectric. So therefore, the ellipse doesn't necessarily provide the same answer anymore. So we basically have to, to solve the problem again. And indeed, we find that the ellipse is not the answer in this case. The answer is a hyperbola, a hyperboloidal surface. Given by this equation over here, if you compare it with the case of the ellipse, the difference is a minus sign. So again, I will not do this derivation. I will let you do it by yourselves <coughs> if you have the inclination. Or if we have time at the end today, we might do it. Uh, but, um, but it's a very similar derivation. We apply Fermat's principle. We basically demand that the path from here to some reference point equals the path from here to the same reference plane of axis. And when you, do, when you apply this principle, you end up with this equation after some algebraic manipulation. So the word confusion, I actually put together a table that contains all the possible cases of, first of all, reflective versus refractive focusing elements, and point sources or point images at infinity. And there's actually six possible cases. For the case of a reflector, we saw that it doesn't really make a difference. In both cases, a paraboloid is the answer. Because I computed already the focusing of an object at infinity, which is focused at the focal point of the paraboloid. And if I reverse the rays, the same paraboloid will take a point source at f and image that point source at infinity. So that is very simple. Now, in the case of the dielectric, 
I can do two things. First of all, let's start with the ellipsoid. We already derived the case of the ellipsoid focusing a plane wave coming from infinity, and we saw that it focuses at the focal point of the ellipse, inside the ellipse. If I reverse the ray paths, then I have this situation where the light originates at the center of the ellipse, and then it gets collimated as it comes out. Now, the reason the ellipse is still the answer here is because the light starts at the dielectric. So, so really, now I'm correct. I can still reverse the optical path, and I get the correct answer. So this is the two cases of object at infinity and image at infinity. But I have to be careful that in the object is in air. In this case, the object at infinity is in air. The focus is inside the dielectric. In this case, the source of the object is inside the dielectric, and the image at infinity is in air. OK. The other case is the one that I just mentioned and I did not really derive, but I let you derive by yourselves. And that is the case of a source that is now at a finite distance, and I wish the image to be at infinity inside the dielectric. So in this case, the answer is a hyperbolo hyperboloidal surface. And of course, you might ask, well, what the heck does it really mean? Can I really make an infinitely large uh, uh, refractor? Well, the answer is you don't have to, because even if the refractor is cut here, since the rays are coming out normal, they do not refract at all at this interface. So really, you can chop the, the uh, hyperbola, and then you can still have your uh, point, your image at infinity. OK? So that's fine. And of course, you can also reverse the ray paths here, and you can create the opposite situation, where now you have an object at infinity, but inside the dielectric, and you have the point image at a finite distance in air. And that could also be a hyperbola, right? Because this I derive simply by flipping the ray paths from one case to the next. OK, any questions about this? I've got a question. If, um, if your point source is within a Grin lens, what is the corresponding index of refraction function? Within a Grin lens? Yeah. I will postpone that. I will cover green lenses uh, in uh, about two weeks. OK. How about on that, yeah. We, when we do Hamiltonian optics, so yeah. I also have a question. Yeah. Um, so if you said with the uh, hyperloidal refractor, if you cut off the back end, the rays will continue to come out parallel. Does that work in the opposite direction? Like if you have a lens that's flat on one end and a hyperbola on the other, can you focus it to a random point? Or not random? Yes, in this case, for example, that would work, right? Yeah, I can't because see it, but I would guess. Because coming in, yeah. The upper right, yeah. But uh, of course, the problem if you do it this way is that you have to cut off the hyperbola at some point, right? So right. you cannot extend okay. your uh, incoming bundle infinitely. But yeah. Thanks. Of course, these are all very highly idealized situations, I should emphasize, right? But, Any other questions? OK. So now that, have, now that we have seen this, I would like to say a few things about wavefronts and what happens to the wavefronts as they go through this. Um, uh, George, I think there's example. another question. Wait. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, yes. So would the ellipsoidal reflector also be more subject to spherical aberration since the focal point is actually within the optic instead of in front of it? Say it again, if, the, if it is in front. Like, yeah, it's comparing the. First of all, all of these are, OK, I have not yet defined what is spherical aberration. But oh. assuming that we know what spherical aberration is, all of these are free of spherical aberration. Right? Oh because uh, they are, by construction, they focus light perfectly. However, spherical aberration will come in, for example, if you, let's take this case. If you move the, well, yeah, if you move this source off axis, mm. then the plane wave coming out will be aberrated. The same here, if you tilt this plane wave again 
the point image will be uh, aberrated. Actually, it will be aberrated, aberrated in more than one way. It will uh, co contain comma as well as, as uh, spherical. So, so these are free of aberrations to the degree that they, uh, that they are op sort of operated as designed. I will say a little bit about aberrations in the coming slides. So maybe you can postpone the answer to you. Know. Any other question? So speaking of aberrations, here they come. Um, first of all, let's uh, let me say a few things about the wavefronts. So. Uh, by definition, I, I will just look at this case and then you can construct similar diagrams for all the six cases that were in the previous slide. I didn't want to do that. It actually takes a very long time to do such a slide, so I didn't want to, to do all of them. But uh, this is pretty representative, so, 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 you, uh, so it conveys the idea, I think. So by definition, we have a plane wave coming in, so you have plane wave fronts arriving at the interface. And also by definition, because by construction we required all the rays, all the refracted rays, they are required to meet the focal point over here. It means that what we have in the inside the refractor is converging spherical waves. Okay? And therefore, if you look at the wavefronts sort of collapsing towards the focal point, they are perfect spheres. This is all in cross section, right? So these are, so these are all perfect spheres collapsing towards uppercase F. It's kind of interesting to think what happens here at the interface. So in the interface, you have two things happening. You have the ray arriving at the left, then sort of being refracted into the sphere. But the wavefront has to remain, uh, to remain, uh, um, well, it has to remain continuous. So basically what happens is the wavefronts, they curve in a continuous fashion as shown here. So you get, uh, um, as the, you can think of it basically as the wave approaches from the left toward the refractor. As it starts entering the refractor, of course it enters first at the apex, and then the wavefront starts bulging. Okay, it, it sort of creates this bulge, and then as it goes more and more in, the bulge progresses to create a, 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 a segment of a spherical surface. Now you can justify that for a number with a number of different ways. One is of course Fermat principle that we just applied. The other is if you think that light actually propagates slower in this medium than it propagates in air, then you can see why the wavefront starts bulging here because as soon as the light enters the medium, it gets slowed down. So now the portion of the wavefront that is still outside in air is actually faster than the portion that is here. And actually, if you even if you compare, let's take this case, if you compare the portion of the wavefront that is here at the apex to the portion that is here to the portion that is here, you can see that this one has traveled the longer distance in the medium, so that's why it is further behind. This one has traveled slightly less, so therefore it is a little bit further ahead, and this one is still in air, so it is even more ahead, okay? So this is another way to explain why the wavefronts are bulging uh, and they become spherical as the wave enters the medium. Um, uh, now, of course, um, the fact that they become exactly spherical is very special to the shape that we chose. Because we demanded Fermat to hold, the wavefronts that result from refraction of this elliptical interface, they actually become spherical. But you can easily convince yourself that if I chose a different surface, say if I chose a sphere or a hyperbola in this case, or some crazy polynomial, quartic, uh, sixth order, I don't know, some generalized surface, then the wavefronts that would get here, they might still bulge because the light would enter a slower medium, but they wouldn't be spherical, okay? Now, the fact that the wavefronts would not be spherical, what it really implies is that uh, the focus is not perfect anymore. If, if this deviate, if these surfaces of the wavefronts, they deviate from spheres, 
then uh, the rays would not really all be at the test, but they would cross at you know, various places. And that is what we call an aberrated uh, image or an aberrated wavefront. So they're all related because, uh, because um, if, um, if uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the wavefront deviates from a sphere, then you call it an aberrated wavefront. If the image deviates from the ideal point image where all the rays meet to a sort of blurry image where the rays fail to meet, then that's an aberrated image. So we will, I will show some examples of that later on today and also uh, later during the class. So <clears throat> there's a special case when the, well, let me save that special case for later. So I will, I will um, yeah, I, I will talk about this in a little bit. What I would like to say next is why is it so significant to why do we try so hard to create these point images? Well, um, we're surrounded by objects that are, most of them, actually the ob most of the objects that we see around us are reflective, right? They are opaque. So light that is incident from a light source, for example, a light bulb or the sunlight when we're outdoors, what happens to the light as it hits uh, the objects that are surrounding us, it scatters. Uh, so scattering really means that, uh, that uh, the light that is arriving from a source, each point in the object, it creates a highly divergent spherical wave. So basically, each point in the object becomes a secondary point source. This is part of a big, of a, another principle in light propagation called the Huygens principle. But we're not quite ready to see that principle yet. It needs a little bit of more um, uh, careful definition. So for now, one way to justify in your mind why this might happen is that the objects surrounding us, they're composed of atoms. And each atom, when it gets hit by the light beam, it will be set in motion. And you can imagine a situation where the motion of the atom will re-radiate a new light beam. So these light beams that are coming out of the, of the, of the atoms composing the surfaces surrounding us, this is what we perceive as, this is what we, I should say, what we receive as scattered light. And this sounds a little bit like hocus pocus, but it's actually not very far from reality. You, you can justify the, the argument I just made with some, uh, some um, very basic uh, principle. So it is more or less correct. The bottom line is that the illumination becomes this divergent spherical wavefronts. <clears throat> now, if you're sitting here and you're observing all the rays coming from the object, you can imagine that it's a mess because you have rays, for example, here you have rays coming from this point and from this point and from this point, from everywhere, everywhere inside the object, you have rays arriving here. So it is very difficult to understand what's going on. All of these rays, they create kind of a very blurry image, very similar to what happens to those of us who have glasses. When you take off our glasses, everything appears blurry. Well, it is not as bad as it would have been in this case, but the reason things are blurry in our eyes is because uh, when we take our glasses off, we cannot form perfect, well, well, it's never perfect, but we cannot form good enough quality images in our, in our eye. So what we need in order to resolve this kind of situation is an optical system or a, or a sequence of optical elements that will pick up these divergent spherical wavefronts and will convert them into converging spherical wavefronts. And if we can somehow create an optical system that will take each and every one of these wavefronts, now we're talking, of course, about an infinite, infinitely large number of point uh, scatterers that are generated here, but if we can somehow take each and every one of them and we can convert it into a converging spherical wave, then when I put all these convergent spherical waves together, I will actually get an image, which will be as close to perfect as I could possibly want within the limits of approximation of uh, geometrical optics. Another way to express it, which is really like a fancy mathematical term, but it is quite appropriate here, is that the, the imaging system creates a map. It creates a map from 
point sources in the object space to point images in the image space. And this map is, of course, very desirable because if it fails, if I try to detect the image over here, that is before the rays have come to a focus, then the map becomes ill-defined because each point over here is receiving rays from multiple points in the object. This is exactly the same situation I was referring to before when we take off our glasses, those of us unfortunate enough to require glasses. For the rest of you who do not need glasses in everyday life, you can of course create that same situation by putting on a pair of glasses that, that, uh, that you can borrow from one of your colleagues. So in both cases you create what we call the focus, which basically means that the image is, uh, is not just imperfect, but it is, uh, it is blurry. It is very far from perfect. However, from what you must have gathered already from the previous discussion, this is a very difficult task. In fact, it is an impossible task. Because uh, you saw that even in the case of a simple uh, ellip ellipsoidal or hyperboloidal um, focusing element, you could see that the one-to-one the -one mapping works only on axis. If you try to focus simultaneously points off axis, well, then of course it stops to work, right? Uh, uh, it is very easy to convince yourself in geometrical terms. Even though there are some special cases you are, where you can have an entire surface that is in focus, but uh, we will talk about this later. So the, this is actually, you could think of it as a very unfortunate event. I think of it as a fortunate event because it keeps people like me and, uh, and Professor Shepard and a lot of colleagues, it keeps us uh, employed. Because this is the whole reason people need optical systems, they need people like us. So, so it is a very fortunate fact. Um, but uh, but um, what I'm trying to say here is that um, this job of perfect imaging cannot be done exactly. So therefore, the science of which the engineering of designing optical systems is to arrive at the best compromise within the cost constraints, the elements that you have available, the physics, of course, this is definitely inviol inviolable. You can violate a budget, right? You can run a budget into the red, as uh, Wall Street banks discovered in the last six months, but you can certainly not violate physics. Even bankers cannot violate physics. So within all these constraints imposed by physics, economics, and so on and so forth, how can you make an imaging system that does the best job uh, possible? OK, so. So let's go back to this question of how can we create good enough quality images so that we can design imaging systems. So let's look at a slightly different case now. Uh, so far we saw pairs of images and sources where one of the two was at infinity. We saw objects at infinity, finite images. We saw sources at infinity, I mean um, uh, finite uh, distance sources and images at infinity. Let's try to deal with this case where we have a point object and a point image. So both are now at finite distances. Based on what we saw so far, and assuming that you're not looking at your notes, the answer is already in your notes if you've reached that page in the notes. But if you haven't seen that, then you're trying to guess. What would be the ideal imager for this case that would take a point object and focus it perfectly into a point image? on axis. Do we know the answer already based on? But <laughs> the concatenation of two uh, hyperbolic reflectors. That's right. Uh, so that is not necessarily the only way of doing it, but it's certainly one way of doing it based on what we learn. If I put two refractive surfaces like this, I can arrange the first one to be a hyperbola what it will do is it will collimate. Hello? Yeah, it will collimate the incident divergent wavefront. And then if I can arrange for the second one to be also hyperbola, then that will focus the plane wave that was propagated here, it will focus into a perfect point image. So this is now a, again a perfect imager, but now it works for finite distances one focal distance in front of the hyperbola, 
to one focal distance after the hyperbola. And um, uh, well, just for reference, this, this, these are the two equations of the hyperbola. I was a little bit careful here to define the axis and the displacements and so on so that the question works. I don't want to belabor that. I let you go back and convince yourself that it is correct or convince yourself that it is not correct, in which case please, please let me know so that I can correct it. But I think I got it right. <clears throat> anyway, so these are the two equations of the hyperboloid. And this is what uh, in optics is very often referred to as an A-sphere. Now, there's a, the, this, this can be slightly confusing, so I'm going to say it a few times here, and then I'm going to ask you to go back home, read it a few times, then print it out, post it in front of your bathroom mirror on top of your bed and so on, whatever, so that you can see it a few times and, and uh, memorize it. Okay, so this type of element whose surface is optimized to, to give a desired <coughs> focus and behavior is called an A-sphere. Again, I have a benefit being Greek. This A in front of the sphere means not a sphere. It's like saying, um, give me an example from everyday life. I can only think technical terms, anisotropic, aplanatic. Give me an example of, uh, from everyday life. Uh, Atypical? With a. Atypical, there you are. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so it is atypical as an A-sphere, right? So another term that is very commonly used is an aspheric lens. And, um, and um, again, I want to emphasize that uh, this kind of A-sphere, it works perfectly on axis, but as you can imagine, if you were to move this point object off axis, it would go off, right? It, would, it could create an image, but it would be highly aberrated. It would, it would be subject to, to, well, definitely spherical and comma, possibly, possibly, well, uh, um, it's a complicated story. Okay, so, but nevertheless, it is very, you can imagine that this doesn't happen right away. There's probably a range over here for point sources that are near enough the axis that, you know, this refractor would work actually quite well. So the question is, can I make such an element? Uh, well. To, make, to, to answer this question, I should tell you a little bit about how optical elements are usually made. So what people um, at least used to do in the old days of expensive optical elements is they would take a piece of glass, they would mount it on a rotary stage, then they would bring a diamond tip near the glass. They would start rotating the glass, and uh, they would rotate basically not at all at the center, and they would let the diamond touch the glass longer and longer as they went away from the, from the tip of the glass. The result of that is, of course, that you create a spherical surface if you move the diamond at a fixed velocity. So fixed velocity was very easy because all you needed is a motor that moves the diamond tip uh, linearly. That's pretty easy to do. To make a hyperbola, you have to plan the path of the diamond tip in a way that results in this non-uniform curvature, right? So this used to be a very used to be thought as a very difficult task. Come on in, someone is outside. Come on in, don't be shy. Okay. Um, so there used to be, a, but uh, but anyway, but in the last 20 years or so. <clears throat> The field of mechatronics that many of you are familiar with the term, it advanced a lot. So people were able to design uh, diamond tools that could very carefully plan the path of the diamond tip and actually create aspheric elements such as this one. But it still remains very expensive. So it could be an order of magnitude difference in price if you to compare a spherical element compared to an A-sphere. Another major invention that helped this business is injection molding. Instead of actually making the optical element itself, what people do nowadays is they can make a very expensive negative. And then they inject plastic into the negative, they solidify the plastic, and then they take it out and they can get any arbitrary surface they want. That is an okay way to make a spheric optical element. Nevertheless, spherical elements remain very popular. And there's a number of reasons for this, that these are spheres, they can work very well on axis, but they can have other problems that are perhaps much more severe when they go off axis. So it is not a, it is not a shoe-in, so to speak, to, to use 
a spheric optical elements. <clears throat> so for that reason, we'll spend quite a bit of time, uh, and also, I guess, because of tradition, to, that, uh, to, spend, to, to analyze what happens to light as it goes through spherical surfaces. So spherical surface, of course, if you replace the hyperbolas here with a sphere, let's say I take this uh, a sphere. I need to say this very clearly because the terms can become confusing. If I replace the A sphere with a perfect sphere, that is with a ball, then of course, as you can imagine, what will happen is the wavefront, even inside the sphere, will not be planar anymore. You can convince yourself, if you think about it, that because the sphere actually bends faster than the hyperbola, the rays that are away from the axis, they will bend more. So you get a slightly focusing effect inside the sphere, which of course is not a perfect focus. It is itself very highly aberrated. And by the time they come out, they become aberrated even more. So you get a very poor quality focus in general. There is a special case where this might not happen, but, but I will skip that for now. So in general, you get an aberrated image. So this is what I meant before by aberration. You see that the rays, they form a blur here. They fail to meet at a perfect focus as would have been required by the perfect optical system. OK, and this particular type of aberration that occurs when you use a spherical surface on axis in the system is called spherical aberration. Someone asked earlier about spherical. This is spherical. You've got a question? Again, yes. Uh, how do you pick Z2? Like, where, where do you choose to pick Z2? Is it at the focus of the first, you know, closest rays or the furthest rays? This came from the hyperbola. Oops. OK. The Z2, Z1, Z2, they come from the hyperbola. Depending on the curvature, uh, the curvature over here defines uh, Z1 and Z2. And then I selected the sphere to match the curvature of the hyperbola near the axis. So if you look at the animation again, near the axis, you will see that they actually perfectly match. But then, of course, the sphere curves faster than the hyperbola. I think the question is uh, in the spherically aberrated case where you cannot find all the points meeting, how can you define the Z2? Ah, OK. That's a really good question. So the way you define Z2 is you look at the two rays that are really, really close to the axis. For those two rays that are propagating at a very small angle, then the same Z2 applies. Then, of course, the rest of the rays, they go off uh, very far from that point. But anyway, Z2 here is exactly the same as it was before, right? Did that answer your question, or? Yes. Hello? Thank you. OK. Now, if you go off axis, then other types of aberrations kick in. So we'll not mention them now. We will come back to this topic later and define them in, in more detail. Uh, but uh, for now, keep this in mind that if you use a sphere on axis, uh, you, in order to, uh, let, me, let me repeat. If you use a sphere to focus a point source on axis into a point image also on axis at a finite distance, then you get spherical aberration in general. OK. Well, that is true, but uh, you know, if you put it over here, <laughs> just move the axis. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's a yeah. Thank you. So let me see. Let me define what I mean by the axis here. So typically, film and cameras, the elements that we use in order to capture images, are flat. So if I put here either my camera plane, I should say the camera, the chip of the camera, right? the camera die, or a film, 
that defines an axis that is perpendicular to the field. So Collins is correct that if I take a point here and I move it sort of randomly through the sphere, it will focus, it will form a perfect image over here. The fact that I for, I try to detect the image not at this point but on the plane means that I will be subject to aberrations. This, this is this is the the proper definition of aberration. And of course, even the on axis point will have spherical aberration as as I as I as I mentioned earlier. Okay. Did I answer that question? Okay. So let's see how we deal with re with refraction from a sphere. <clears throat> so that, as you can imagine, is a quite complicated problem because uh, here is a ray that is arriving from some point source on axis. It hits the sphere. And then my job is to find which direction this ray will be refracted inside the sphere. So now, again, I can use one of the tools that we have in our arsenal. I can use Fermat's principle, or I can use uh, Snell's law. The two are, of course, identical. The fact of the matter is, in this case, they would both be quite complicated to, to do. So we'll do simplification. First of all, let's define some notation here. I will denote as x the distance that the ray intersects the sphere, I will define as alpha left the angle that the ray makes that the ray makes with the optical axis to the left of the interface. This is the interface. And then alpha right is the angle that the ray makes with respect to the horizontal, the optical axis, to the right hand side of the interface. Okay, that's my notation. And now for generality, I do not assume that this is air anymore. I just assume that I have two dielectrics. One is has index n sub left, and the other has index n sub right. So it's a little bit cumbersome to carry left and right around, but it is convenient because we will need that for a mnemonic later on. So how do we solve this problem? Well, the way I, I elected to solve it, it's a little bit easier, it turns out. Is uh, So for the first time today, I will not use Fermat's principle, I will use Snell's law. And of course, Snell's law follows from Fermat's principle, so I haven't really changed anything. It's just more convenient to, 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 to do the math this way. So to apply Snell's law, I have to figure out which way is the perpendicular to the interface at the cross-section of the ray with a spherical surface. And of course, if I have a sphere, conveniently, the normal to the sphere goes to the center. So here is the normal to the sphere. It goes to the center, and some additional notation I will denote, I will denote as r the radius of the sphere, and phi I will denote the angle that this particular uh, normal, this particular radius, makes with again with a horizontal axis. And I'm done. This is, um, I think this is all the notation uh, that I needed. Actually, I'm not done yet. So I also need to, to apply Snell's law. So to apply Snell's law, I have to look at the angles that enter Snell's law. So if you recall, we apply, we apply Snell relative to the normal to the interface. So here's the normal, here is the ray. Therefore, this angle is theta that will go on the left-hand side of Snell's law. And the corresponding is theta sub right that will go to the right-hand side of Snell's law. So, speaking of which, here is Snell's law. n left times the sine of the angle on the left-hand side will equal n to the right times the sine of the angle on the right-hand side. And uh, now I have to do a little bit of geometry. So these angles, they're not known to me yet, but I can observe that Alpha left is the same as the angle from the horizontal to the ray over here. And the angle from the horizontal to the radius equals phi. So this means that I have this property over here. Theta left equals alpha left plus phi and the corresponding equation for the right hand side. And um, I can also substitute these two relationships into Snell's law, I can, uh, I can apply a little bit of trigonometry in order to break the sign of the sum into this rather complicated looking expression over here. So 
Having made much progress, all I managed to do is write a complicated set of trigono trigonometric relationships. In fact, if I were to do a numerical solution to this problem, <coughs> I would just stop here and feed it into a computer and solve. But I don't want to do that quite yet because there's quite a bit of intuition to be derived before we go blindly into a computer and, and plug the, the numerics. So of course the thing that we do in physics when we try to derive intuition from a very complicated formula like this one is we make approximations. And the reasonable approximation to make here is that the rays that are arriving to the element are limited in a relatively small angular range. This turns out to be a very practical assumption. It is a, it is a very common situation in optics to have this, um, uh, this uh, uh, small angle approximation. And it turns out that even when the small angle approximation is not exactly right, you can still do a first pass of the design of an optical system with this approximation, and then you can improve it by doing sort of more complicated numerical analysis. So it's a very good place to start the analysis of an optical system. So the key assumption here is that alpha sub left, this one, is very small. If that is true, and also I need one more assumption, which is that this distance over here, the distance that the ray needs the spherical interface, is much smaller than the radius of the sphere. In other words, the sphere is not very small, but it is a relatively uh, small curvature. All right? It has a relatively large radius of curvature, or equivalently a small curvature. So if these two assumptions are correct, it is also reasonable to assume that alpha right to the right-hand side of the interface is also a very small angle. And if I make the set of assumptions, the entire set is called the paraxial approximation. So paraxial really means that everything is confined to be near the, <coughs> near the optical axis. Very well. So if we do this approximation now, a lot of this gets simplified because of this uh, Taylor series. The sine of the angle of a small angle equals the angle itself. The cosine of a small angle equals 1. And also the sine of this angle phi is equal x over r. I don't have to touch that one. This one is actually exact. But I can also neglect the cosine of phi because, um, well, because, again, uh, making the paraxial approximation. So if I do that, then I do a little bit of rearrangement here. I arrive at this expression that uh, says that uh, the index of the right, the index to the right times the angle to the right equals the index to the left times the angle to the, to the left times this expression over here. Now you might wonder a number of things. For example, why did I leave the index here? I'm looking for alpha right. So why don't I just divide along and get done with it? There is a reason, and it will become apparent in a moment. For, but for now, I'm almost done, right? I have managed to do what I wanted. I have a pretty closed form expression for the angle of refraction inside the sphere. Now I'm going to do something really strange. I will derive a similar expression for light propagating in uniform space. Now, this sounds totally useless, right? But let me do it anyway, and bear with me for a while. I have a ray which is propagating in free space. For reasons of notation, I will define two refractive indexes that are equal. One is n left, one is n right, but they're both equal to the same index of refraction n. And what I'm interested to do is I'm interested in relating the angle of the ray on the left-hand side with respect to this reference plane over here and the elevation of the ray with respect to the same plane, with the same quantities at the second reference plane, the elevation and the angle on the right-hand side. But this is a rather trivial problem because, for example, Fermat says that in free space, the ray must propagate at a straight line. So therefore, I can immediately derive that alpha left equals alpha right. It's not very surprising, right? I'm, I'm stating the obvious here, and I'm making a big deal out of it. But nevertheless, let me write it like this. Since the indices are the same, I can also multiply by those indices. And um, what about the elevations? Well, the elevations satisfy a simple equation relating the tangent of the angle of propagation multiplied by the propagation distance d. 
So the elevation to the right equals the elevation to the left times this, <coughs> times this quantity. And then in the spirit of the paraxial approximation again, I'm going to drop the tangent because the tangent of a small angle equals the angle itself. And I arrive at, um, at um, a set of equations, x right equals x left plus d times alpha left, and this equation that I got before. So now let me put the two together. Let me put the free space propagation that I just derived, a relationship between the ray elevation and the ray angle to the left and to the right of a uniform space of distance d, and the equation that I just derived earlier for the refraction of a, of a ray from a spherical surface, spherical, ref, spherical refractive surface of radius r. Okay, so these are the two sets of equations that we got. This is the set of equations that I got immediately before, and this is the set of equations that I saw that I got earlier when I solved the a refraction problem at a spherical interface. And again, I want to emphasize that both of these are correct in the paraxial approximation. These are not exact expressions. The equal sign is a bit of an abuse here, right? Because I've sort of assumed that the paraxial approximation is correct. So we're going on with this assumption now. That's why I'm putting equal, equal signs. Okay. And I added one more equation that I didn't write before that says that x to the left equals x to the right. In this case, this is a trivial thing. It says that the ray is continuous, right? It, it arrives at the interface at a certain point and leaves from the same point, right? And that's kind of obvious. The ray should not jump. So what is remarkable about these equations is that they're both linear, uh, and, the, uh, and the relations and the quantities that they're linear with respect to are these two elements, the elevation and the angle of the ray. So you can think of them as kind of transport equations. They allow you to transport a ray from two very basic optical elements. One is free space propagation. It allows you to transport a ray through uniform space. And the other is a refractive interface. It, again, it allows you to transport the ray uh, from, or, from the left to the right of a refractive interface. And um, because they're linear, we can also write them in matrix form as follows. This is not new. I just took these equations and rewrote them. And I rewrote them in a slightly funny way. Uh, I kept the index of refraction times the angle. Can anybody, now that we sit in this form, I will go to the matrix in a moment, but now that we sit in this form, can anybody guess why did I go to all this trouble to keep the index of refraction in this expression? Why don't I just write the angle by itself? Is there a, is there a case, a situation that we've seen where this quantity may be conserved, for example? dispersion thing again <coughs> or where it depends where you have different ends I suppose and therefore different angles depending on your yep. wavelength even simpler actually uh, if you think of uh, Snell's law yeah you, you are on the right uh, track there if you think of Snell's law Snell's law says that n left sine alpha left equals n right sine alpha right. And of course, in the paraxial approximation, I drop the sinusoid. So therefore, I, I arrive to the conclusion that this quantity at the first element of this vector is actually conserved. And the rest, of course, uh, you can 
go over it yourselves and convince yourselves that the equation is correct. This is basically the state in the same equations. And um, these matrices, we'll use them in the next lecture in order to do ray tracing. So basically an optical element can always be decomposed in a sequence of refractive interfaces and free space or uniform space propagation. So the reason the matrices are convenient, sort of jumping ahead a little bit, is because if you have a, if you have a cascade of optical elements, then you can ray trace simply by multiplying these matrices. I will do that in detail in the next lecture, next Monday, but uh, this is why we went to all this trouble to derive the paraxial approximation and then write it out in this matrix form so that you can use matrix properties to do ray tracing. Let me ask one more thing before we quit. Uh, do you see Snell's law in any of these laws over here? You can see Snell's law on the handwritten slide over here. But how about what about here? Can you see Snell's law somewhere? Another way to ask my question, these equations that I wrote here, can they capture Snell's law in some way? Can I, do they include it? How? If the elevation doesn't change, if we apply it at a point where the interface is. Okay, that is correct. The, yeah, that's correct. Okay, maybe I should restate, I, I asked the question in a confusing way. The Snell's law at a flat interface, and the same, uh, the same that I rewrote over here, <clears throat> can I get it somehow from these equations? What is the radius of curvature of this surface? Infinity, right? So if I plug in infinity, if I plug R equals infinity in this case, of course, physically what happens is the interface becomes flat. In the equation over here, this term goes away, and I get what? I get n left, alpha left, n right, alpha right, x left, x right. So you are right, x left equals x right, but also n left alpha left equals n right alpha right, which is actually Snell's law. So this, again, I'm, st I'm restating something that I said before. This is the reason why we put this product in the top element of the vector when we write this expression. Okay, so we've run out of time. So any questions yet? Oh. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. This would be one zero. Eh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll fix the nodes. There's a typo. The first matrix should be one zero, and then the rest is correct. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Can uh, did everybody hear that? There's a typo in the nodes. The first, uh, the elements of the first row of this matrix need to be swapped. Okay, so I'll see you all next uh, Monday.